This is a presentation from the Wapanka Historical Society. Thank you. Everybody hear me? Okay. I'm going to take off my jacket. It's warm in here. Um, let's begin. Um, now listen to the words that come before all else. We bring together our minds and give thanks to one another, so be it our minds. We bring together our minds and give thanks to the Creator of all, for it is the Creator who has brought us together as one, so be it our minds. These are the first and the last lines of the Oneida Thanksgiving prayer, and I think it's think that it is appropriate to begin each endeavor by giving thanks. Hello, or Sigoli. My name is Lewis Clark, Lewis Vincent Damien Clark III. That's a heck of a lot of names to hang on a little baby. I am of two worlds. My father's people were from Poland, good Catholic Polish people, and my mother's people were here waiting for them. I have bingo on each side of the family. Um, I am one with the people of the Standing Stone, the Onanigiwas. You know us as the Oneida Tribe of Indians of Wisconsin. We are members of the Iroquois Confederacy, a union of tribes that was prominent from the Big Water, which we now call the Atlantic Ocean, west to what is, is called now the Ohio Valley, south into the Cherokee lands of Georgia, and north into Canada. The five original tribes the Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, the Seneca, and the Oneida, and then the little brothers, the Tuscarora. The Iroquois call themselves the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse. I am of the Bear Clan. We are the artists. We are the storytellers. I started writing poetry in sixth grade. <coughs> sixth grade boys who write poetry on the reservation inside of a Catholic school, well, they get beat up a lot. <laughs> But there is poetry in the air on the reservation. It called to me. I can hear it in my head. I can hear it in my heart. I was schooled in the art of storytelling by my elders. Through the blue haze of cigarette smoke around the kitchen table that served as our campfire, a world was open to me. Sometimes from deep inside of a beer bottle, brandy bottle, or even a cup of, cup of Sanka, stark truths were shared. I share some of them with you. On the 4th of July, during my memories, Indians would gather. Indians from all over the world would gather at the Ball Diamond, located just one good baseball throw west of Holy Apostles Church in Oneida, Wisconsin. Teepees would rise like the phoenix being reborn. Tents, logs for sitting, and campfires could be seen outlining the baseball field. Gathered around home plate would be the drums. The drums. Not the white man drums that you hear on television. Boom, 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 boom. No, nope. these drums were like Indi were Indian drums, beating, boom, 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 like a heartbeat, the heartbeat of my nation. They beat all day, they beat all night, and to a little Indian boy tucked inside of his bed, those drums made him feel secure. So I wrote this poem as I grew up. It's called Fourth of July in Oneida. Off in the distance in my memory I hear the drums, the drums, the drums drawing near. The heartbeat of my nation that sounds this time of year. The drums, the drums, the drums drawing near. White man's Independence Day, old glory waving clear. The drums, the drums, the drums drawing near. My father standing tall and proud, on his breath a trace of beer. The drums, the drums, the drums drawing near. My future, my past, my hopes and all my fears. The drums, the drums, the drums drawing near. My wife my children, my heritage to hold dear. The drums, the drums, the drums drawing near. At one time in our history, Indians were encouraged to leave the reservation, to become white, if you will. During World War II, my mother rented herself out as a domestic for room and board so that she could attend high school off the reservation. She learned many things, some annoying things for little boys, as we had dinner at 6 p.m. each night with silverware arranged just so that you had to eat from the outside in, and our little finger up in the air when we had tea. The other kids were already outside playing. My mother looked to the white world where success seemed that it could, by careful planning and diligent work, be gained and measured. She did many things. She accomplished many things while the men were off fighting World War II. She received an award from El 
Eleanor Roosevelt for, for a drawing she did. She played baseball on traveling teams throughout the Midwest. She was a left-handed hitting, right-handed outfielder. Then the boys came home. She was pushed to the back of the bus because she was a woman. And because she was an Indian, she began to disappear. So I wrote this poem for her. It's called 1944. I wish that I would have known you back in 1944 when dreams lay all before you, life was knocking at your door, when mundane moments of memory were orchids bursting into bloom. I wish that I would have known you, but glory fades too soon. I saw your pretty picture. I heard the many stories vested fully in your prime. You reached for greater glory. Eleanor came from Washington to acknowledge your talent in art, and baseball, like a league of your own, earned a place within my heart. Your beauty was more than youth with your cat-like eyes of gray. Childlike innocence filled your soul when you led your children to pray. Once upon a time before dreams crashed to the floor, I wish that I would have known you back in 1944. She married my father in Chicago in 1945. He was on a three-day leave. That was the year that the Cubs were in the World Series. In, in 2016, my first book was published and the Cubs won the World Series. Coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> I just had to work that into my speech. Being a Cubby fan, you understand. Uh, my mother lost her first son in 1947. The white world couldn't save him. My father, after fighting in World War II and Korea, looked to the Indian way of life. He said after being all over the world that the white world only made up about 10% of the population. He said that life in the circle seemed better than life on the linear plane, which European culture forced upon us. He also said that if your belly is full and you are warm, everything else is a bonus. Little boys don't always understand, so I wrote, Papa. Papa, oh Papa, I remember your tattooed arm with mother's name written green on the, in the skin wrapped around my chest, timing my breathing to yours so the beer in your belly wouldn't nauseate me as you blew it upon me. I dreamt of escape. Counting your fingers like a convict counts the bars of his cell, waiting for a time my sentence would end. I struggled against the warmth you tried to show me in love. And it was all about love. I was just a kid, and even now I can't judge their lives. They both survived the Depression. They survived World War II, the Cold War. My dad was in 42 sea battles that he never talked about. We found that out in 2015. We got his records and they lost two children. My mom was a talented woman, but at the time there weren't a lot of doors open for her or any talented woman. They made things the best that they knew how. Th this, I believe. The next time a Clark boy was born was 1956. Me. Basically, I was an oops. You know, Neil Diamond's hot August night and the leaves hanging down and the grass on the ground smelling sweet. And nine months later, there I was. April 1956. Their lives were set at the time, so my grandmother raised me for maybe the first four years of my life. It was a freedom that I can never recapture, and I wrote this poem about growing up without indoor plumbing. I also became very much addicted to peanut butter and these quart paint cans and spam. I still love spam. This poem is called The Outhouse. On the worn path with the blanket of summer to cover us, Mother Nature held little boy's secrets as we ran in the night. Came that snow, that old trickster lady betrayed our confidences, exposing our fears along the path. Grandma would tell us of her sorrow painted in yellow snow. Got caught? <laughs> we moved into the heart of the reservation in 1960. My grandma told me to be nice to the Indians. So I sat on the sidewalk by the store and I asked people if they were Indian. I was going to be nice to them. I caught hell for that, but what did I know? Everyone looked like people to me. Mom and Dad were totally new, totally into this new environment. You know, the 1960s, the Rat Pack, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Lucy and Desi. So I wrote this poem about them. Um, does anybody here remember hiding under our desk when we were practicing for the Atomic bomb? Okay, then, then, then that's a good one, okay. His and her kimonos, a moo-moo for my mom. Nixon wants the White House and Khrushchev has the bomb. Dino's drinking every night, singing words of love.
crouching low beneath my desk, are bombs falling from above? Tasting crackers that had no taste in race riots in the south, headed to Chicago on an oleo run, daddy said shut your mouth. The fool, he won't notice, the smart man, he won't say. There were Friday night piano lessons and my bonnie rolled away. Gin inside the goblets, whiskey in the den, mama tasted brandy, a nightmare now and then. Everything's laughing, laughs and giggles, it was all for fun. No one was supposed to be hurt till we came undone. Sometimes the sound of a little slap echoes through the years, haunting generations wrapped in bitter tears. The gossip of a Christian lady who didn't know love at all made spectral shadows in my life and happiness I can't recall. Then I was to learn that I was an Indian. No one had told me that I was an Indian. I had no feathers, no scalps hanging on my belt. I did like talk like Tonto. Um, Kimosabi. This is how many of us learned that we were Indians back then. The poem is called First Grade Lessons. Come in, come in, come in. The party's just starting. I was flat on my back getting hit in the face when a young man informed me what was my race. I was bleeding, crying, but I couldn't agree. I didn't look like anything I saw on TV. I didn't have a pony. I only had a cat. My daddy didn't wear a loincloth. Thank God for that. <laughs> I never smoked a peace pipe or burned someone at the stake. I was just a little kid, for heaven's sakes. We thought that we were people, my relatives and I, living, breathing human beings until the day we die. But religion called us savages, heathens if you will. They paint our face like mascots, like animals that you kill. That's the way it always is, that's the way it's always been. But what about this Jesus? What color was his skin? At school, baby Jesus was always blonde haired with blue eyes. It was interesting. Time went on, 1968. It was a dark, stormy night, as Snoopy would say. But yes, it really was. There, there was a noise perhaps a scream, the type of scream that pulls you questioning from your sleep. In this state of living, you begin to question everything. The poem is 12-year-old boys. 12-year-old boys, 12-year-old boys, brings a smile to your face if you ever were or hope to be a 12-year-old boy. 12-year-old boys aloft in their dreams, invulnerable, immortal, and then, once upon a midnight scream, 12-year-old boys awaken into men. Dreams shattered, innocence scattered, mother battered. Another piece of the pie for 12-year-old boys. 12-year-old boys when innocence dies. Then I heard the scream again, and 50 plus years later I can still hear the scream. The poem is Silent Night. A shallow cry heard over and again, like an echo from the fallen house of Usher. A protector's cry, one never written in the lines of heroic novels, but heard in unwritten lies. I retreat inside my covers like a turtle inside his shell. I feel the cold gray hand of fear clutch my throat like a master clutching his whip to kill all freedom dreams. Then the silence that holds you like a cell door, standing like a warrior who stands when beaten, wanting to die proud. I explode into their sacred sanctuary and see what no child should ever see, their humanness bleeding out on the floor swelling like bruises upon her face. He slinks away in shame. She covers herself the same. And I, I am left alone. What do you say? What do you do? The sun comes up. You eat breakfast. Then I wrote, wrote reality. Lord, I don't want to be a warrior. I dread the thought of pain. My silence is mistaken for bravery like teardrops in the rain. No one can see the thunder. No one can feel the night. I never wanted to be a warrior. I was always forced to fight. So I read. I sang when no one was around. I was one of the early perfectors of the air guitar. And I wrote, I wrote poems, I wrote stories. The thing that stands out here is that I could share these things with my Indian friends, my hopes, my dreams. And they didn't share my words. They didn't make fun of me. But I was going to a white school, and when I shared, I was laughed at because the white world didn't seem to think that people's dreams and words were sacred. I attended a Catholic school on the reservation, but I was the only Indian student, so I was involved in a few fights. And I wrote this poem from those memories. As a human being, I knew that I was supposed to stand for something. I probably did a lot of stupid things, said things that I shouldn't have, got into fights that I shouldn't have. 
and probably hurt people when I should have known better. I wrote this poem, Play Playground Bully, about a certain individual who, for a time, enjoyed using my head as a trampoline. Someone would grab me from behind and hold me down while this individual jumped up and down with his knee on my head. This may explain a lot about my thought process that I consider a great sense of humor. I just hope and pray that in my need, my never-ending fight to fit in, that I never became that bully. I know that I cross boundaries now and then, but I owe a debt of gratitude to the bullies that beat me. They made me see that I never wanted to become them. The poem is Playground Bully. My mind whispered secrets late at night under covers that hid the day's harvest of bruises, whispered softly so no one could hear, he's not so tough. I know, I know, I know, I know, my salt-tasting lips washed with another night's tears, saying the mantra to the gods of fear each night, alone, in bed. I know his secrets. I know his weaknesses, his size, his parents, something made him different, as my skin made me. I felt sorry for him. Through hair-clenched fist, I beat him each night, but he beat me each day. Then our union collapsed, a guardian hit him, and I wasn't worth the price any longer. I don't miss him, but I'll never forget him. It was a hard time and a hard poem to write, because it happens on schoolyards every day, and it shouldn't happen at all. But after every dark stormy night when the dawn breaks the plain and rainbows dance in the sky, wonderful things can happen. The best thing that ever happened to me happened in high school, 1972. I saw this young lady, blue blouse, blue skirt, high heels, and the biggest smile on her face as she was walking, walking down this hallway. She seemed to notice everyone and everyone seemed to notice her. She looked like she was someone who would be fun to be around. So naturally, after building up the courage, I asked her to go out with me. Not only did this young lady have looks, charm, and grace, but she also had intellect. She politely turned me down. I'm nothing else if not persistent, some people say annoying. But finally, after a year of asking her out, her mother and her older sister made her go out with me. Uh, last year when I told a neighbor this story, he told me that's called a sympathy date. Um, but like Paul Harvey used to say, now you know the rest of the story. I've written many poems for her in our 49 years together. That's my wife right there. This poem comes from our days of having the phone attached to the wall. Everybody remembers that? We had a red one. Dancing with the phone. Passions, new passions, discovered only in love's aging process, turning hours to minutes to seconds at a glance. Sweet sixteen, shadows, love speaks, across the years, across the kitchen floor, dancing with the phone cord at a glance. Sitting, weary in my years, watching, smiling with a grandmother who shares my bed. Sweet sixteen, at a glance, staring, passions build. She glides, she floats, dancing with the phone. Sweet sixteen forever at a glance. And then this poem to highlight her happiness with the simple things. It's called Sea of Yellow. Planted in the garden of innocence and surprise, blooming in virgin soil right before my eyes, dreams I never dared and hopes I never dreamed, dancing slowly in the night, a soft romantic scene, played before an audience for 40 years each day, love becomes a sculptress molding us like clay, Tell in our years, our innocence, sipping just like wine, in my childlike love for you, I give a dandelion. We all have storm clouds in our lives, but she always saw me through. I wrote this for her. It's called Rainbow Woman. Here you are safe, she said without words, as pain fell from my eyes. Rolling like thunder across the purple horizon, sobs muffled in a pillow. Here you are safe, her hands said caressing gently my head, my heart. These are not tears, these are not tears, mumbling in humiliation. Indians don't cry. Here you are safe, her breath soft upon my neck. In silence a blessing, our breath united, calm like a mirrored lake. Here I am safe in the spirit, in the love, promised in youth, held through the years. Well, from this wonderful union, we produce six children of which I am honored to say all have received their bachelor degrees or more 
without the aid that many people think Native Americans receive. In 1984, we purchased a home in Amro. And just like I told some people, we used to come up here and have our chickens butchered every year. And then once a year, we'd bring our football team up here and have them butchered too. <laughs> anyway, we had to remodel the house to accommodate the four children. We were like little house on the prairie, but it was my Camelot. The house had a chimney running all the way up side the side, and we candy striped it so everybody knew where we lived. One Saturday, our oldest, eight years old, was moping around the house. I asked why, and he explained that all his friends were trying out for the 11, 12-year-old traveling baseball team, and because we lived in a small town, nine through 12-year-olds were accepted. I said to him, what kind of friend are you? You should be up at the baseball diamond cheering and supporting your friends. A few hours later, he returned home as a starting pitcher and shortstop on the 11, 12-year-old team. Ten years later, he also played four years of college ball. Actually, all four of our sons played college ball, so I'm bragging right now. Um, ten years later, his nine-year-old brother followed him to be the starting pitcher and starting shortstop on the 11, 12-year-old team. There was a regular Little League program, but this was just a traveling tournament team. Some parents went to the town board and had all the nine and ten-year-olds removed from the team. After 19 years of coaching youth sports, baseball, basketball, wrestling, and refereeing, and umping for both boys and girls sports, excuse me, I've learned that many parents make it difficult to be a kid. So I wrote this poem for the kids. It's called Superstar. No, I'm not a candidate. No headlines will be mine. My pedigree excluded me. My star is yet to shine. I did okay at baseball games. I can't hit or run or catch. I sit the bench and play right field. When they toss the ball, I fetch. They signed me up for football too. They thought I'd be a star, but getting hit and hitting back, no way that I go far. Then wrestling and soccer came. It's more than I can take. Don't they know these brittle bones are often prone to break? Then Tiger Woods, he made it big, so dad bought me some clubs. But golfing too was not my thing. At that, I was a dud. Basketball in my underwear, I guess that I did fine. I couldn't shoot or, shoot or dribble or set a pick, but I was good at riding the pines. My poor old dad would get so mad I never seemed to play. My mother too, she never knew to sit the bench I prayed. I don't know when it all began, it's hidden in our history. To be a jock would be a shock, for me a real mystery. I like to run, it's kind of fun, but I really hate to fight. If all I did to be, was be a kid, to me, that'd be all right. My wife and I talked the situation over, and in our house we have a saying, don't complain if you're not going to do something about it. So we got some funding, put out a call for old Amro uniforms, and started our own 9 and 10 year old tournament team. We lost every game, but we had a blast. There are some 9 year olds out there who can throw over 60 miles an hour, and my best has been only 63 miles an hour. So I wrote this poem, it's called Little League Pitcher. I'm the greatest little league pitcher, of that there is no doubt. I've never had a batter who could ever hit one out. Though I never throw no hitters, it's just not what I do. I lay the ball in easy, they hit it where I want them to. I'm the greatest little league pitcher, of that there is no doubt. My fastball is like lightning, my change of like a drought. I never throw a curveball, I don't think that it's a charm. And very few pro players make it with just one arm. I'm the greatest little league pitcher, of that there is no doubt. If a batter acts like Babe Ruth, I simply strike them out. But if I see the batter really has no chance, I throw the ball and hit the bat, and I watch the runner dance. I'm the greatest little league pitcher, of that there is no doubt. Whenever I walk out on the field, my family stands to shout. They think it's really pretty cool. They think it's kind of nifty to see their dad in little league, although he's over 60. During the summer, I still throw at a target. I've been throwing since the 1960s, just in case there was an emergency and my Green Bay Packers needed me. But two years ago, during the Memorial Day holiday weekend, with four unprecedented falls during a baseball game, one in which my nine-year-old grandson took me out at home plate and was heard to utter as he walked away, get him a body bag, I wrote to Mark Murphy, the Packer president, 
and uh, admitted that this year I didn't feel up to being able to fill in a quarterback in an emergency. President Murphy wrote back expressing how disappointed the organization was because I was their secret backup plan if Aaron Rodgers didn't report. A copy of the letter is on the back <laughs> table if you want to see it. Anyway, during those 19 years of being involved with youth sports, Coach Honey, that's what the kids called my wife because I'd all go, Honey, and they go start calling her Coach Honey. Well, we developed a program where all players would play the same amount of innings per game. They would have to play all of the positions at least once, except catcher, which could be dangerous, and they would have to pitch at least once. The kids bought into the system completely. Sometimes the parents, not so much. Um, but after eight years, what was uh, having the best? I was yelled at a few times and once for having the best players on the bench while we had a close game going on. I won't say how I got yelled at after we got out of the situation, but, um, but in eight years after developing the program, we went undefeated twice and we won three championships. That's how I believe Little League should be played. And I have written a book, it's called Little League, A Father's per Perspective, but I haven't looked for a publisher yet, but I, I basically just like to write. But I, I hope that someday this one will get out there. I speak in my books of having difficulty progressing up the ladder of success. After scoring the highest on three tests for advancement, it finally took the union stepping in to get me a promotion to foreman in charge of drainage of all county, state, and federal highways in Winnebago County. The question was, would I be able to get the men to work for me? I was raised to treat people the proper way, to lead instead of to drive, I had many good people work for me, Zim, Jay, Chicky, Swamper, and Rick, who they called behind his back, the angry trucker. Rick was a uh, uh, veteran. He was in the service. He was in, oh, I can't think of, 1991, Desert Storm. Um, he could do anything. He literally could do anything, just like my dad. But the bosses never appreciated him because I don't think he respected the bosses because they didn't do anything to be respected at the time. All I did was thank him for all that he did, and he did so much for me, so much for the company, and I learned to pre how people like wanted to be treated. So, I started reading them my poetry. You wouldn't believe how eager people are to get back to work after a break or lunch <laughs> when you start reading them poetry. Still, they had their favorites, which, which they made me read to any new additions that they would get on the crew. We actually would take one of my poems, write all our names on it, what our positions were on the job, put it in a plastic bottle and attach it to the culverts that we put in, underground, under roads. Um, some of them were 126 feet long, so we did a lot of big jobs. And I think everybody wants to be remembered. And this was their chance to be, someday they'll dig up those culverts and they'll find our names and what we did. And they really bought it and they took care of me. I mean, my men took care of me. but. They loved this poem, and they made me read it to everybody who was on our crew, and they even made the bosses come out and re listen to it sometimes. It's called Drunken Cow, and it is based on a true story. I went down to the canning factory sitting on the edge of town where they pick up all the corn and sell it all year round. They tear off the stalks, the leaves, and the cobs, and they throw it all away so the farmers come and pick it up, and they feed it just like hay. Drunken Cow. It sits there in the noonday sun until it's raw and ripe. I never smelled anything that bad, not even pickled tripe. Still, the farmers go and gather it in. On the checkbook, it makes no dent. They stuff it in the storage bin and leave it to ferment, drunken cow. Now cats and rats and mice and dogs, they won't touch them a drop. But to Bessie and Bossie and all their friends, it's become their favorite crop. They gather together underneath a tree and munch it all the day. I do believe it's a coming trend for a cow to join AA, drunken cow. I feed it to my cows and then they grin from ear to ear. They stagger around and some fall down upon their dear ear. I tell you this, it ain't no joke, though some call it a spoof. I put up with these crazy cows because their milk is 90 proof. <laughs> so. Ah, now I want to stop here and say, in my years, I've discovered that everyone is special. We all have talents. If you have a dream, 
like my wife says, never give up, never give in, and never miss an opportunity when it presents itself. I wrote, but my life was, is so busy, I never really attempted to get published. Then one day there was an ad in the newspaper. It said, if you write, send us some samples. Naturally, I was wary, but I said, what the heck. Soon they asked for some more samples, but they didn't ask for money. Then they called and they asked for 40 samples, and they offered to publish this chapbook. They offered to publish this chapbook, giving me a thousand copies as payment. The book won an Oneida and Wisconsin Arts Board Award, and we've even had to have more copies made, three times in fact. It was the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, the Sequoia National Research Center, that published the chapbook of my poetry. So the first thing that I did, that we did, went down and bought this coat with the leather patches. <laughs> I wanted to look the part. Ah, then I began giving speeches. First two poems, then 20 minutes, pretty soon an hour. And uh, in Berlin, the, I did for a bunch of kids in Berlin, high school kids, they kept me two and a half hours. I won't talk that long tonight. Um, my daughters went to Hollywood and they bought me this tie. <laughs> and if I didn't have trouble with my fork, I'd be wearing it, but it's all stained, so I don't wear it. But I bring it that day. Well, the Arsenio Hall wore that on his show back, way back when. And uh, someone said that I should publish this, my speech. Someone else said to send it to the Wisconsin Hos Historical Society. So I did, and they asked if I would come to Madison to speak with them. I learned that the lady who lives in my dashboard and gives me directions has one heck of a sense of humor. We pulled up to some intersection on State Street and the lady said, turn right. Now, at the end of State Street, the curb isn't like this. The curb is like this. She told me to turn right, so I did. And I drove on the sidewalk right through camp campus with vendors on both sides of me and kids getting out of the way, but she took me right to my parking space. So what can I say? <laughs> we, when we entered the office after the ritual pleasantries, they, Kate, who is now the editor, was in there and she just looked at me and she said, we don't accept poetry submissions. I was standing there looking like the Make America Beautiful Indian with one tear streaming down my cheek. But then they said they'd publish it if we would call it a memoir in poetry and prose. There had never been one done like that before. My publisher, Kathy, said they were taking a chance. And this, with this being the first of its kind, she winked at me and said, don't quit your day job. I wanted to bring more poetry out to the people. I believe poetry is important, and I'm honored that Joy Harjo, an ex-poet laureate of the United States, named her latest book, Warrior Poet, a memoir in poetry and prose. How to be an Indian in the 21st century won the 2017 Midwest Booksellers Choice Award, the 2018 Wisconsin Library Award, and another Oneida Arts and Wisconsin Arts Board Award. Um, we were taken to Chicago to give a speech and near a Harry's Carey's Bar, and not only did the Historical Society ask for another book, but because I seemed to be the only Cubby fan at the convention, the bartenders wouldn't let me pay for any drinks. I love Cubby fans. <laughs> I always pay to wear a Cubby hat. Rebel Poet has also won a Midwest Book Award and just recently another Oneida Arts Board Award. So like my wife says, never give up, never give in. Then to have a cherry added to my ice cream sundae, which a doctor doesn't allow me to have anymore, He's also taken away the three foundations of life. International Delight French Vanilla, Potato Chips, and Coca-Cola. However, when I was in college, my poetry professor said, what I write isn't poetry. And then my theater professor said, if what you write was any good, somebody would already be doing it. 
But I wrote a play that will be performed on public radio this sometime this year. The play is called Little Boy Lost, Stupid Indian. And we just, um, the other night, we just heard the first take of it. So that'll be on YouTube too, so. We now have 16 grandchildren. Faith, Danny, Julia, Liza, Addison, Cameron, Mara, Hope, Morgan, Elnor, Harrison, Zoe, Jack, Ollie, and Lewis. And I'm supposed to be retired, but it seems that I'm busier than ever, perhaps because there ain't nothing good on TV. But still, I like Lydia from Create TV, so I wrote this poem. It's called Dietlicious. Stood on tiptoe, ballet dancer, drenched in memories of food, reaching for the stars, stole a piece of sunlight, smiled it upon the world like Tony, like Maria, the most beautiful sound, painting pictures. I just wanted to say, Green tea steamed shrimp dumplings. I never had them, but I just wanted to say that. I am a grandpa, so what have I become? I said slightly glum as grandchildren invade my house. I stagger around like a half-drunk clown attempting to be quiet as a mouse. When they're finally asleep, I try to keep my santee going room to room, flipping off lights that burn day and night. Electrical will shoot to the moon. All faucets are dripping and I'm always tripping on wet towels strewn on the floor. And set in concrete, each toilet seat stands upright, oh Lord, what a chore. To put the seat down, I'd say pound for top pound is really an impossible task. Grandma says, shush. I said, can't they flush? Is it really too much to ask? The air conditioning is on. I'm almost gone out of my very old mind. The wind is blowing and I sit here knowing that each window is open, I find. Ten pop cans are open, I sit here moping, barely is there gone a sip. And against my own wishes, I'm doing the dishes. You'd think they would leave me a tip. <laughs> then I do get to babysit. We, my wife and I, are babysitters now. Oliver, our 15th grandchildren, grandchild. His mother is doing her residency in med school, and I call her Dr. Clark. We spend three days a week with Oliver and his parents in a small two-bedroom student apartment in Madison this spring. One bathroom. Our first morning there, our son lit, a, son lit a candle in the bathroom. I woke up, got out of bed, before I drove a comb across my head. I spent down, bent down to wash my face, and I heard something funny. Not ha-ha funny, but something unusual. Then I smelled something funny. Not ha-ha funny, but something unusual. I stood up, looked in the mirror, and it was the movie Home Alone. My head was on fire. It's grown back now. Our grandson reminds me of me. Blue eyes, double chin, little pot belly. He's so beautiful and innocent. I rode a day with Grandpa. Run, 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 Grandpa, run. Let's go to the park and have some fun. Run, run, run to the swing for a ride. Run to the merry ground, then to the slide. Run, 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 let's ride the bike. You on the big one, me on my trike. Run, 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 let's play some ball. I'll hit a home run, you make the call. Run, run, run to the ice cream store. We each get a scoop, who could want more? Run, 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 we'd run all day. Running this fun, and then I say, shh, shh, shh. Don't make a peep. Grandpa's ba babysitting, fast asleep. We learn lessons every day. A poet laureate came to town and was giving a class on poetry. Bring one poem to share, the sign said. The lecture focused, as I was to learn, on how you should never repeat a word or phrase more than three times in a poem. Mr. Clark, would you read your poem? He said. I said, I'd rather not. <laughs> he smiled and said, Mr. Clark, you're a published poet. Everyone here is interested in what you've written. It's called Old Man Fantasy. I was shocked, I was shocked, I was shocked, I was shocked when it occurred to me a car is a car is a car is a car, but some folks see things differently. Some folks see in the land of the free just a symbol of success. You don't go far in an Indian car described as a rolling mess. I was fine for a long, long time, living in my little house dream. There was me and mom, more kids than I saw, and all the platters were all looked clean. Then one by one, the children run to feather their own little nest. There I was at 55, not ready to be put to rest. 
So I went to school, which was kind of cool. I had fun on my spring break. Then I joined the church, and I ate perch on Friday instead of steak. Now I write poems when I stay home, found that I had the time. Now I look, they published a book full of my Indian rhyme. I was shocked, I was shocked, I was shocked, I was shocked when it occurred to me. A car is a car is a car is a car, but a horse is fine with me. They haven't spoken to me since. <laughs> and then, for some reason, people always ask me to read this poem. It's called Torn. I am torn between the wilderness of my youth and the white world we call civilization, between the freedom of the fields and the fight for human dignity, between the false comfort of an apathetic attitude and the calamities inherent in for having empathy for my brothers and sisters of all nations. I am torn between the false security promoted by technologies that leave us fat and swollen upon the couches of our homes and the savage need to rebel against an authority that fails to abide by the very laws they are sworn to uphold, between the urge to close my eyes to hide away from the injustices of the world and the desire to plant the seeds of freedom, of justice, to watch them bloom. Please, Lord, grant me the wisdom to overcome the conflicts of my humanity and the courage to make my life meaningful. Let me say, however, for me, life has been great. With love as our foundation, I've had a great life. There have been some highs, some lows, and because of the foundations of the family that my wife and I have established with love at the center, we've been able to reach for the stars. And this poem pretty much sums it all up. It's called Job Jar. I meant to clean the car today, erase the wash erase the wash me tattoos, destroy evidence of birds bombing raids, scrub bugs last axe from the windshield, I meant to clean the car today, leftover popcorn from a $5 cinema, sunflower seed shells from a would-be ball player. I meant to clean the car today, the tic-tac-toe on the dust-covered dash, finger-painted windows, root beer stains and mud. I meant to clean the car today, but my son said, hey dad, do you want to play catch? Hit a few? Catch a few? Pretend a bit? Well, I meant to clean the car today, oh well. I hope that you see in this little speech, and I hope that I've shown you that success is really about being yourself. Your voice, write, or whatever you do, do it for you. Make yourself an honorable person. Show who you are, your uniqueness, and really, in the end, we'll learn just how much alike we all are. And let's all work together as human beings are supposed to do to make this world as it should be and not accept it as it is, to steal a phrase from Don Quixote. Here I would like to invite everyone, this is a commercial, here I would like to invite everyone to Oneida, my home, our home, to visit. Go to the Oneida website, Oneida Tribe of Indians of Wisconsin, or they also have a Facebook page, and just come and join us for Apple Fest, where you ride an old-fashioned trolley to the Apple site, then ride a horse-drawn wagon at the orchard, pick your apples, or just enjoy the atmosphere, then return to the parking site where the community has come out to present horse shows, petting zooms, and games, food, and history. It truly is a wonderful experience where everyone is welcome and there is no admission fee. Or Harvest Fest in the fall, where there are hands-on demonstrations of harvesting and working the great gift from the creator, corn. From picking to chucking to weaving to roasting, grinding, and my favorite part is we all get fed for free. Another wonderful experience, one which you will never forget. Or come and visit any of the, our other community projects. Our museum, our schools, our turtle design roundabouts, our buffalo farm, our beef farm. You're always welcome and it is a wonderful place to be. I worked on the highway for 35 years and the thing that I noticed up in Oneida is that they wave at you with all your fingers. So I was used to having one finger being waved at me. <laughs> My last poem is a blessed story that happened to me. It's called A Christmas Gift. I saw the face of God today as he sat next to me in church. His toothless grin as I held his hand, our eyes met when we said hello. The choir sang, bells were ringing, we both turned next to pray. A little old man in a tattered coat, I saw God's face today. A certain smell drifted through the air all across the pew. So I smiled, for in my ears, Jesus had his smell too. With shaking hands into his purse, he put something on the plate, a human being so worn away. I saw God's face today. 
I clasped his hand with hollowed eyes. He smiled into my soul. A hint of mint as he walked away. A little old man in a tattered coat. I saw God's face today. Thank you for all, all for, thank you all for coming. And I leave you with one last thought from the book, How to Be an Indian in the 21st Century. In the long run, people will give you what you expect of them. So expect their best. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you.